Hey everybody, it's Bob Murphy here. I just want to do a quick little video on what's called the social cost of carbon. Now this is a concept that has been in the uh, economics of climate change literature for a while, but lately it's taking on more prominence in policy circles because the Obama administration is using this for regulatory agencies to be able to do cost-benefit calculations on various policy proposals. So for example, uh, if there's new regulations on microwave ovens and their efficiency in using energy, and this is really what happened recently, then part of how the agency will assess these impacts or the regulation in terms of cost-benefit analysis is to say, well, if it leads to lower energy use, well, then that leads to lower carbon dioxide emissions, and therefore we gain benefits in terms of averted climate change damages down the road. All right, so this is uh, very important that this number accurately represents something in the real world since federal policymakers are going to be using it. So what I just want to tell you in this quick video is that there's actually uh, getting into the own uh, the models that the Obama administration uses their own models and just looking at their own analysis it's funny that you can get wildly different numbers depending on how you tweak the parameters. So just to give you some examples of what I mean the way these damage estimates work is that actually most of the published studies in the peer-reviewed literature show that global warming uh, will lead to net benefits for humanity for the next several decades and it's only around the year 2060 or so that the damages begin to outweigh the benefits and the benefits include things like longer growing seasons for certain farmers uh, fewer deaths during the winter from extreme cold lower heating bills things like that so if you think about it a changing climate would hurt some people and help other people and in certain regions might be beneficial and other regions might be harmful and what I'm telling you is the published peer-reviewed literature says that actually the benefits will outweigh the damages in most models and simulations at least for the next several decades so what that means if you think about it is that we're right now when we're trying to estimate the so-called social cost of carbon the negative externalities from carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases what you're going to compute is a present discounted value of a stream of decades worth of net benefits and then at some distant point in the future it flips to net damages. So the discount rate that we use is incredibly important in calculating that magic number. And since it's a stream of benefits then followed by a stream of net damages, the lower the discount rate, the worse the social cost of carbon appears to be, the more harmful emissions appear to be, whereas if there's a high discount rate, then those damages decades down the road aren't getting uh, given very much weight and the upfront benefits weigh more in the calculation. So just to give you uh, an idea of what I mean here, the Obama administration recently reported came out with an updated estimate and depending on which year you use and so forth, the social cost of carbon now, the way the media is going to report it, is in the 30s right thirty dollars a ton on thirty five dollars a ton in that sort of range but if you used a seven percent discount rate again with their own models using their own analysis of costs and benefits if you used a seven percent discount rate which the federal government previously told its agencies to use when doing cost benefit analyses it said as part of its list of instructions hey when you're doing something like this that involves things over time use a 7% discount rate. If they use their own procedure when it comes to climate change economics, then the so-called social cost of carbon would be zero or even possibly negative because those benefits would get counted much more heavily than the future damages. So that's just one example. Another interesting fact in this literature is that most of the modeled damages in these computer simulations occur in foreign countries because if you think about it, as the, as the globe gets warmer in these computer models, who's gonna bear the brunt of that? It's not gonna be people in the United States. It's gonna be people living in underdeveloped regions that can't adapt very well to change, coastal areas, and people who live near the equator. They're the ones that are gonna suffer the most as the earth gets warmer in these computer models. And so just to give you an idea of the distribution of these impacts, the Department of Transportation uh, a few years ago when it came out with its updated fuel economy cafe regulations, fuel economy standards, had calculations for the so-called social cost of carbon and they said that the global social cost of carbon was in the $30 range. It was in the 30s. 
and that's in accord with what people would hear in the mainstream media. But if you just looked at the United States, the social cost of carbon was only $2 per ton. Right, so one fifteenth of what the global figure was. So wh what does that mean? It means, among other things, that if the federal government were, say, to impose a $30 per ton carbon tax, which a lot of people are saying is a no-brainer, given the consensus in the literature, well then what that would mean is the United States would be penalizing its own economic growth to confer net benefits on people in other countries. Now one might argue that that's the fair thing to do, that the United States shouldn't be having its own economic growth cause people in other countries to suffer climate change damage, which is what happens in these computer models. But the point is when people, especially conservative groups, tell Americans, oh, hey, this is a win-win scenario if we had a carbon tax because we deal with this climate change externality and if we use the revenue to reduce income taxes, then we're gonna have a stronger economy. They probably don't even realize that the way these numbers work, no, what happens is that, exter that huge externality in the model is due to other people bearing the brunt of those damages. And so again, a carbon tax calibrated to the global social cost of carbon in practice would mean the U.S. would forfeit potential economic growth to spare those model damages hitting foreigners. Again, might be a defensible thing to do in terms of your value system, but clearly Americans are not being told this information by the people pushing a carbon tax. If you're interested in these issues, I'm going to be offering a five-week online course at the Mises Academy on energy economics that starts on July 2nd. So if you just go to uh, the Mises Academy website, you'll be able to get full details or go to my blog at consultingbyrpm.com to see uh, the full information. Thanks, everybody.